This is mains voltage LED tube light, and uh, well, I say tube light, it's actually strip light, and it's very common on eBay these, these days, and it's got some advantages over the low voltage stuff. Now, it's a very close relative of the traditional Christmas lighting tube light. This is a proper municipal grade, it's a really expensive commercial uh, LED tube light that's used in the sort of Christmas lighting, and whereas this is quite complex inside. I mean, I'll be covering this in a separate video at some point, but this has basically a, a got a channel in it with the LEDs and resistors all actually wired as a string of almost like fear lights and then pressed into it. It's quite a laboriously manual looking assembly process for this one. However, this one is cheaper and simpler. Uh, the downside is that it, the LEDs all point out one direction, so I'm not 100% sure how this is going to look in a sort of municipal, you know, application, you know, actually on metal frame lights if it was put outside um, on, on, you know, Christmas lights in the sort of on lamp posts. But uh, I might give that a little go and see what it looks like. It claims to be IP67, and having said that, it is solid plastic. In fact, it's two layers of plastic. Uh, the original stuff was originally classed as double insulated. It's not really quite trustable as that. I recommend that all metalwork it's on be grounded. But um, the, uh, the the plastic is pretty robust, and the downside of these plastics, they say they're fully waterproof. I certainly wouldn't submerge it in water. Plastic, even though you tend to think of plastic as being waterproof, Many of them do actually absorb water very slowly over a period of time and they go cloudy as a result of that. It's partly ultraviolet degradation, partly moisture ingress. And you can tell it's moisture ingress because uh, certainly on the, the old tube light, um, I quite often found that the old Tungsten tube light you used to get verdigris forming around the copper wires inside. And latterly with the newer LED stuff, with the DC had fairly high voltage, in this case peak 330 volts, the, the DC bus bars inside, it actually caused rapid corrosion. It would be distinctly rusted inside and then it would cause electrical problems. But, uh, this is very cheap, as I say, because it, it's very easy to manufacture versus the other one. And you buy it on eBay, in by the meter basically, uh, because it can be cut at every meter. And this uh, is a one metre length. It was originally a three metre length, but I've cut that a bit off because I took it to bits just to save time. And we'll, we'll take a look at that later. Actually, I took it to uh, the original video that I recorded had the full three metres and then I screwed up. So, yeah, isn't, it's one metre now. Anyway, moving on. The system uses uh, a bridge rectifier. Now, I want to say at the beginning that this uh, this has a slight shimmer to it. It's not visible to the eye. The iPad, as you know, makes everything shimmer a bit on 50 hertz because, yeah, it's kind of optimised for the 60 hertz frequency. And to be fair, this is actually dipping off at the bottom of the sine wave. But uh, let's do the maths here. It's a 330 volt peak sine wave. There's about, the way it's wired, although there's 60 LEDs, it's actually two parallel pairs. Uh, it's, should I say, it's actually 30 parallel pairs. but uh, So that's about 30 LEDs times, say, 2.5 will start lighting up equals... It's going to start lighting from about 75 volts onwards, so it is lit for most of the sine wave, and I have to say, it, it looks fine to me. There's no visible shimmer at all. Likewise, I've used the... Uh, the, the tube light, the LED tube light, the, in municipal decorations for so long, and uh, it, you never ever saw any flicker. It was fine. Also, it was completely dimmable because it, it's utterly simple. It, it, there's no sophisticated electronic circuitry. There's just basically a bridge rectifier. So as long as you've got an, enough load, and so quite sometimes you need a packer load just to make sure it works properly, you can dim this as well. However, uh, this stuff is taking. Approximately, it's drawing approximately 26 milliamps a meter, which is roughly 13 milliamps per LED because it is the parallel pairs. And the power is roughly 6 watts per meter. So you can get, uh, off eBay, you can get listings that go up to about 20 meters. And um, when you order 20 meters, you get it in one continuous length. And 20 meters would be about 120 watts. Is that right? It would be 60 watts, it was 10 metres, yes. Yeah. So that is 120 watts for the full uh, 20 metres. And the suppliers, although it seems to only go up to that sort of 20 metre length, you can buy from some other suppliers, you can buy 100 metre rolls of this stuff, which 
Makes me wonder, given the current, I'm wondering if that's a 3 amp bridge rectifier in here or you're supposed to cut it down and use it in smaller sections because as, as I say, it is choppable every, every metre and I'd guess that based on the fact that this is this 220 volt version is based on um, two sections joined together with a solder joint in the middle here there's a possibility that there'll be an American or other countries that have the 120 volt system version that is probably cuttable every half metre, I'd guess, maybe. But, um, right, let's get this, this out of the way. Let's unplug it, in fact. So the way this is connected into, there's two bus bars that run the length. Actually, you know what, let's, let's doodle the schematic of this. I'm not sure if I mentioned in this video already, because I tend to forget things like this, but when you buy it by the meter, if you buy just one meter, then you get this power supply lead, which is the rectifier, and the end cap, and of course the meter of strip. If you then buy more than that, if you buy like three meters, it doesn't add that much more to the cost, because now all you're doing is paying for the strip, and it's only a few pounds or a few dollars per meter. It's really, really cheap. So here's the schematic, if, if you could really call it schematic. There's the mains in, and it goes straight to the rectifier. AC plus minus comes out rectifier, goes out to spikes, because that's how you connect into this stuff. This is how you connect it, this is how you join it, and then it's got bus bars along the inside. The spikes I'm talking about, if I uh, pull this end cap off, th these are glued in with hot melt glue. Not a huge fan of the fact they've used hot melt glue, but the bus bars are in the end here. And in this plug is a little insert that is now trapped in here. But normally when you get this stuff, you'd get the insert, you'd push it in to those, the ends of the wires and the spikes would just displace the metal. And then it would just basically have two pins that when you put it into this cover here, it would then plug in uh, to the sort of socket receptacles at the back, and that's how it's connected. Likewise, if you join it, I assume they do joining kits for this, they certainly do for the tube version, then you get the double-ended spike that you press in, um, and you then put a sleeve over and then push the other one on and then put the sleeve back, usually quite a tight fit, and then you apply a glue to seal it up. And at the end, for safety, you can't just leave it open because it's got the live bus bars here. You have an end cap that goes on. This is a huge end cap. I'm not sure what's going on here. It Maybe they have intended it for use with hot melt glue. The ones I'm used to using have a friction fit cap and it's a solvent glue so it all really seals properly because it has to be sealed if you use it outdoors as they claim this stuff is rated. With the hot melt glue, it doesn't stick that well in the sort of polythene plastic they use for these. And that means that, you know, with the expansion contraction over time or flexing and bending, uh, it gradually cracks the glue off the plastic. I mean, this came off very easily. And when that happens, you end up with two layers quite close together and you get a capillary effect and it actually wicks moisture up because uh, the end caps and joints are just the place where this stuff fails all the time usually, certainly the, the tube light version. So here we get the bus bars that are going along the inside of that. And the tape sections basically have a series of LEDs along them and you've got a wire coming off and going onto the bus bar at one end, going through all the LEDs and resistors, and then going onto the bus bar at the other end, and then it starts again. It's sort of cuttable at that point, and then it's just another section. It's interesting to note that whereas the traditional tube light version, the, the LEDs are quite spaced about every second LED compared to this, and it means that you can actually cut it in between the LEDs on the proper cut mark and splice it together and the LEDs pretty much look that it offers good continuity. The LEDs are about the same distance apart. With this stuff, there's a very distinct gap between the sections, which has its pros and cons. It makes a visible missing dot. It's very vis It looks like there's an LED out in that gap, but it isn't. It's just the, the cutting gap, the sort of separate, the sort of spacer. And I can actually show you that. Because uh, here's the other bit, so let's find that gap. There it is. Do you see the gap here where it's clear? And one end of this strip has gone to one end side of the bus bar and the other has gone to the other. So they want to keep them a good distance apart because otherwise there's a possibility that if moisture did get in, it would track at that point, which, you know, uh, moisture was going to be a killer in this stuff anyway. But um, it also, I like this because it makes it very easy 
to cut it exactly on that sort of midpoint of that. It makes it a very clear and decisive cutting point for actually splicing it and putting the spikes in. The tubelite stuff has a similar arrangement, but it's much, much harder to find. You have to look for markings on it, and then certainly in the LED stuff there is little scissor marks in this, and then it's got a sort of plastic core in the middle that's uh, designed to sort of reinforce it to help you cut it. And that, you, quite often the scissor mark goes out of sync on the printing. With the actual cutting position, you have to just look up to the light and sort of get it into the middle of that, cut it. So the circuitry inside this is super simple. It is just basically, it's pairs of LEDs. It goes from the, the safe plus, the positive bus, bus bar, it's got the LEDs wired as pairs. And it's got a couple of pairs of LEDs like that. And then a resistor. And it just continues that all the way along. It's like uh, four LEDs, resistor, four LEDs, resistor. And you can actually see the resistors under here. And I checked, there, there are 14 resistors per length. So that's 14 resistors. There are 60 LEDs, but 2 times 30 LEDs. The resistors are 470 ohms. So the combined total resistance in there, uh, when you add all the series resistors up together, is 470 ohms times the 14 resistors equals 6,580 ohms. And that's just a good value that just balances out, the, it limits the current through the LEDs to a proper value for them. It's also worth noting that I checked the thermal dissipation. Now, it's, I've calculated out the power dissipation of these resistors, and it works out roughly about 0.2 watts each, which is within the rating. And I also looked at it with the thermal imaging camera, and rather oddly, one of them uh, was stone cold, as if there's something wrong in the circuit board, like, or maybe it's been, it's this one here. Uh, there's nothing visibly wrong, but it looks as though either that resistor's fault and it's short-circuited, or there is a, a sliver of uh, solder underneath it, but uh, this resistor is just stone cold while all the others are hot. Very odd. Very strange. But yeah, it does that uh, for the full run, and then it goes to the negative bus bar rail. And that's uh, pretty much it. It's, it's very, very simple. Now, the actual construction inside is this tape. I tried getting a whole section of tape out, but it didn't go too well. And you can see the sort of, uh, the sort of parallel arrangement inside it there. Um, I'm going to dim this uh, down a little bit just to make it that's better. Is that going to help make that more visible? Uh, it might make it more visible. But you can see the sort of parallel arrangement in there. And at the very end, you've got a big solder contact at the end with a, uh, with a wire tail in it. And the construction inside is very, very clever. It's very reminiscent of the traditional tube light, which is based in a core with an outer sleeve of plastic. But uh, the construction in this one is, let's see, it looks roughly like this. So it starts off with a channel, oop, and it's got two actual cores of wire built into it, stranded wire. Now, I tested this wire, and I it's, it's aluminium. It's either aluminium or it's an alloy. I did the flame test on it because it felt strange. It felt that brittly effect, and it's quite springy. And when I put the flame under it, it all just wilted down and glowed and dropped off. I also tried soldering the other end. It would not take solder at all. So this appears to be an aluminium core in here. But the plastic goes round that, skirts around that, and goes down like that to form the channel for the LEDs. So I'm guessing this is a continuous production line where this channel goes in and the machine must actually basically drive a wedge in that folds this up and it lays the strip inside. So the strip gets laid inside here and it's got the LEDs on it. It's got also got the resistors on it and it's got the solder pad on it. The solder pad at each end, the wire seems to come off with a big blob of solder and it gets taken over the top there and then, as far as I can see, there's no physical, well, you can't solder onto the aluminium. It looks as though it's just punched through with insulation displacement, just so it pushes into the strands of this wire. So I'm not sure how that's going to go in terms of long-term reliability, in the sense that you've got what I've, you've got a solderable wire, wire here, uh, but being pushed through what seemed to be 
to all intents and purposes aluminium cores. I'm not sure that's going to go. I'm also not sure how that's going to go with the spikes that go into the end of it because the spikes in here looked a sort of brassy colour and they were pushing into the basically the end of an aluminium core. So it makes me wonder maybe you're better not going for the full huge 100 metre runs of this and actually keeping shorter runs in case that causes a burning problem at the end with the with the reaction between the, the metals because aluminium is not great electrically. It's, it tends to form an oxide layer quite readily on its surface, which is an insulator, unless they've got some sort of fancy alloy here that sort of prevents that, but then that wouldn't be aluminum. Mm, very odd. But anyway, we've got this channel, so they, they put this strip in, it seems to be put in, I'm guessing it goes in by machine, and then once they've actually got it laid in, the next part of the machine then extrudes another layer of plastic round the outside of it like this. And I know that it's extruded like this because when I took that apart, I thought it was going to be pretty much like the old tube light used to be. So with a bit of force you can actually separate it. So here's the outer plastic layer and then there's the inner core uh, showing the sort of hollow channel down the middle and then that sort of the sort of lips that can be just parted to actually get this tape in. So yeah, it's an interesting construction. It also, you can see that during the manufacture there's a knurled wheel uh, drives this through because you can see the sort of knurling effect and it's also it had a slight hiccup at this point. It's Ironically it's near that dead resistor but it, there's a hiccup here that something's stalled and it's kind of like the plastic is malformed, it's blobbed a bit. Um, it's also interesting to note there's a date printed on the back of it. Uh, it says 2016 stroke 08 stroke 08 and it's got uh, L O 220 volt to 240 volt and it is, you know, it'll cover the 220 to 240 volt range, no problem. So, um, my experience of stuff like this in the, been, in the past has been that even with the super high profile stuff, even with the expensive tube light, you occasionally get manufacturing blips that uh, you get a little loop of wire actually comes through the plastic. You know, if there's been a, a problem with the laying in of the wires, you can sometimes get a loop out. It can happen with ordinary wires as well. It doesn't seem to matter what quality the brand is. Uh, you can all, all, always have to allow for the fact so that there is possibility that, you know, a wire contact could have protruded through the plastic during the moulding process. And as I say, I've had that with the really expensive tube light, but then again, I have used tens of kilometres of, you know, the other tube lights, so I was bound to find that at some point. I've also found other ones with holes uh, through the uh, plastic, but having said that, this section I got, it was only three metres, but, you know, it seems to be quite, you know, it seems to be quite solidly made. It seems that everything is well sort of aligned in it. But you shouldn't really handle something like this if it is actually powered, uh, in case it does have that situation. So that just leaves the fact that this stuff has the LEDs just pointing out one side, which makes it ideal for lighting coving and stuff like that, or, or just like architectural lighting, or laying a strip into steps or something like that. But uh, it does make me wonder how well su suited it will be to Christmas lights because you'd kind of want something that's sort of like multi-directional for that. And you could, you could actually, you could shape it like this, but you, because of the fact it is flat, it's not really wanting to, to form a nice tight bend at the end. You'd have to allow for a modest curve just to sp avoid putting stress on it. But um, yeah, it's interesting. It, it's, you know, it's very simple. There's really not a lot to go wrong. So... The, ultimately, the lifespan of it will depend on making sure it doesn't get overly flexed too much. I mean, it's, it's actually pretty robust, this stuff. It's pretty good. But also, it will depend on the quality of the LEDs. And you just really never know what you're getting when you buy uh, LED tape. You just don't know how good the LEDs will be. But yeah, it's interesting and uh, it's quite a smart implementation. It's kind of... it's an improvement on the old tube light in the sense that they've got it man easily manufactured like this, but it's also not as versatile from the directionality as the, the old tube light. But um, I quite like this. I'm going to get some more because uh, it, it's quite a neat material. It's quite useful.